Does anybody remember? Because I didn't. Does anybody remember? What's that? <laughs> Does anybody remember anything that happened in January? Um, anything that happened in January? I don't. Um, what's that? Well, I knew that, but I don't remember what happened that day. I remember. Yeah, did it snow that day? Yeah. <laughs> um, does anybody remember what the the theme, uh, what the verse for this year was? Because I'd kind of lost sight of it, but it actually has been fitting in. Everybody stare at Karen while she thinks. <laughs> it did not. <laughs> That was a good guess. Pete, that was last year. That was 2021. No clues? Andrew, nothing? Yes, yeah, that's last year. All right. Luke, chapter 2, verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom, and when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but when they began to search for him among the relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And... Yes, so did I when I read that this morning. I'm like, oh, we we're supposed to be talking about that all year. And um, funny how it turned out that even though I would kind of hadn't been re referencing this verse for most of the year, we've been talking about uh, Christ in you. Um, all the way back when we did, the, you know, in Deuteronomy, that the word is not far, it's not way out into the sea, it's not up in heaven, it's in your heart and on your tongue. Um, and constantly been looking at the fact that um, we spend so much of our time um, looking out there for Jesus, um, not realizing that he never left his father's house. And, uh, you know, so why are you looking for me? And did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And so when we think about um, just kind of using that as a reference and, and all the other verses that we've looked at throughout this year and, and some that we've been looking at for many, many years, you know, uh, Colossians 3, you know, and the mystery been hidden from ages and past generations is that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Uh, you are no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, barbarian nor Scythian, but Christ is all and is in all. Um, all these passages that we've been talking about and, and looking back on, and it's still sometimes um, curious to me when we look at uh, things that are going on in the world and we hear about 17-year-old kids that are um, just torn apart by anger and frustration and feel like there's no reason to even live their life anymore. Um, and you just want to grab them and put a flashlight inside of their own soul so they can see the truth of, of who they are. But it gets, it's very difficult because we, not just them, but we all as human beings continue to not see each other as we really are. And so as I was you know doing this morning, I, I recently... Um, look back at um, one of my earlier messages from this year when we were talking about this, and I used this uh, quote. I didn't quote it exactly, but I wanted to read it to you today. This is, once again, Thomas Merton out of Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. This is what's part of what's called his uh, The Fourth and Walnut Epiphany. It's a very famous thing that he wrote about. Uh, he says this. He says, It is a glorious, glorious destiny to be a member of the human race. Though it is a race dedicated to many absurd absurdities and one which makes many terrible mistakes, yet with all that, God himself gloried in becoming a member of the human race. 
a member of the human race. To think that such a commonplace realization should suddenly seem like news that one holds the winning ticket in a cosmic, cosmic sweepstakes. I have the immense joy of being human, a member of a race in which God himself became incarnate, as if the sorrows and the stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me now that I realize what we all are, and if only everybody could realize this. But it cannot be explained. There's no way of telling people that they're all walking around shining like the sun. And, um, you know, that that epiphany that he had is, is just... I mean, it's literally famous. If you go to Louisville, Kentucky, and you stand on the corner of 4th and Walnut, which I believe is actually now Muhammad Ali and Walnut, it's been renamed, there is a pillar with a plaque with this quote on it, because this is a world-famous quote. When he wrote this and published it in 1966 or 67, it spread like wildfire. And literally, it's a historic monument um, in Louisville, Kentucky today to where he was standing on this corner and he made this realization. Um, but it, once again, it, it shouldn't be that big of news. As he says here, it's not like you're holding some winning lottery ticket to realize that you are the same race that God himself became incarnate in. And, and then my favorite, my favorite line of that is, is when he says that I have the immense joy of being human, a member of a race in which God himself incarnate, became incarnate, as if the sorrows and the stupidities of the human race could over, overwhelm me now that I realize what we all are. But how many of us are so overwhelmed by the stupidities of this life? We, we, we allow all the things on the exterior to weigh us down. We allow all the, the little T traumas and the big T traumas to weigh us down and to strip us of our true essence of our humanity, which is a humanity that's incarnate of God. And that when God really wanted to show us who He was, because all through the Old Testament we're constantly asking God, God, just show us who you are. And finally He did by becoming human. And so when we think about what that means, that when God wanted to show us who he was, he became one of us. What does that mean? It means he is us. You want to know who God is? Look at your neighbor. Look at your co-worker. Look at your spouse. That's who God is. Now, again, those people aren't God. Because as we quoted from Colossians, and all we say, no free to bring us in, um, but Christ is all and is in all. So Christ is all of those people. Now, those people aren't Christ. They're not God. But Christ is them. Why? Did you not know that he must be in his Father's house? What is his Father's house? The temple. Right? Am I making that up? It's a trick question. I believe it's first Colossians, or first Corinthians, first Colossians. I say first Colossians. There's no first. Col- there's only one Colossians. Uh, first Corinthians. I believe it's three sixteen. I'm just turning there because I think I have this this verse memorized. I'm not going to read it beforehand. I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, first Corinthians three sixteen. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So here we have Paul saying, Did you not know that you are God's temple? And then you have Jesus saying, Why are you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my Father's house? And we've always known that the temple is God's house. The tabernacle that they carried around while they were in, you know, while they were in Exodus and they were journeying through the desert, right? They had the, the tabernacle that they carried with them, and every time they stopped, they set it up. And then when they got to permanent home, they built the temple. And even though there's that weird story in one of the Samuels about they're trying to build the temple, and God shows up, I think it was Nathaniel, and he says, "Don't build the temple." I didn't tell him to build the temple. Why are they build the temple? Don't build the temple. You have to build the temple, right? Um, because once again, when Jesus says, there will come a time where you no longer worship in the temple, you no longer worship in the wilderness, right? What is he saying? Because the essence of, what, of where you're going to worship is in you. You are the temple. 
And so the fact that we allow the, 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 these absurdities and the stupidities of this life to overwhelm us is in a lot of ways an affront to who God really is. Because, once again, when He wanted to show us who He was, He became one of us. And I don't know about you, and I, and then, like, I, I might just be saying something here, like, yeah, okay, whatever. But when I say that, it, like, gives me, like, a chill in my spine. That realization that, um, are you okay, brother? You like a water or something? You got a cough drop or water or something? You got her? Okay. Um, I don't know. I feel bad. Um... So when we think about that 17-year-old kid that, that Karen was talking about, how can we take that kid who is in that place of darkness and we can tell him that the human condition is actually a really great place to be in? It's really great to be human. Don't you know that you're the same race that God himself became incarnate as? How can you allow these sorrows and the stupidities of this world to overwhelm you now that you realize what you really are? I mean, he might hit me. <laughs> I don't know. But there's got to be a way in which we can tell people that they're all walking around shining like the sun. Because no matter what they're doing, they are. Because you're not, you're not going to dim God's light. I don't think it's humanly possible for us to dim God's light. Now, it might be humanly possible for us to believe God's light is dim. It might be humanly possible for us to not be able to see God's light. But once again, God's light is always going to shine in the darkness. And it's our job to realize what we all are. It's our job to stop, you know, going out and looking, but to realize that He's already in there. We don't, that kid doesn't need to find Jesus. He needs to realize that Jesus is already in him. He's never left him. And the only reason why he's made it this far is because Christ is in him, the hope of glory. And the only reason why he has any hope for the future is because Christ is in him, the hope of glory. And then one day he can stand there in the corner of Fourth and Walnut and have an epiphany where he realizes what we all are. He's walking around shining like the sun. Because there's no other way for us to be but walking around shining like the sun because you cannot dim God's light. Once again, you can believe that God's light is, has been dimmed. You can believe that God's light isn't there. But once again, Paul says, Colossians or Galatians, now that you've become hostile and alienated in your mind, once again, we were never actually alienated from God. We were, God was never actually hostile towards us. We just thought so in our mind, but the reality is it was never true. So even though, once again, we believe that God's light has been dimmed, we believe that God's light isn't in there, we only believe those things in our mind. And what is belief? Belief is just a collection of thoughts that have been confirmed by a preconceived bias. That's all belief is. And so if we can get those collections of thoughts out of the way that have a preconceived bias, and we can recognize that our, what we believe to be true is just an illusion, and once again, maybe it's not about believing, it's about living. Maybe it's not about believing that God's going to save this kid, but it's about loving this kid so God can save him. The difference. It's a difference in the way in which we need to operate and work in the world. Because, once again, God is real. And even though every once in a while I still ask Him, are you sure you're real? Are you sure you're there? Because sometimes I'm not sure if you're there or not. And then He shows up. <laughs> so maybe it's just my way of tricking Him into showing up. Because, you know, I like to spend time with Him. So, get Him there.
So when I think back, you know, we're talking about where we were at the beginning of the year. And, you know, we're so excited because Jesus is born into the world and uh, he's presented at the, so the birth of Jesus in chapter 2, the shepherds and the angels. Jesus is presented at the temple. And then the very next story is they lose him. <laughs> they go a day's journey. And then they realize he's not there. So then they got to go a day's back. So now there's two days. And then they search him for three days. So for five days, you're the mom. This is, I think I talked about this at the beginning of the year. You are the mother of Jesus. You are the mother of the Savior of the world, and you've lost him for five days. He's just gone missing. Right now, my kids are not the savior of the world, and I've lost them for five minutes and freaked out. Okay, so can you imagine the responsibility? And I'm not even a mother, right? It's very different from a mom when your kids can't see your kids or whatever, right? She lost them, the savior of the universe, for five days. He just hanging out in the temple. Why are you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? So many of us are panicked. Living this life. Panic. Trying to find the solutions. Panic. Trying to figure out how are we going to get through this situation that's in front of us. How am I ever going to overcome this obstacle? How am I ever going to make this, make this work? How am I ever going to live another day? We're panic. Living our lives. Because we don't realize that he's already in his father's house. We're panicked because we don't realize what he really is. He's one of us. And the answers to our, our problems aren't always going to be in some book that was written thousands of years ago. The answers aren't going to be in sitting alone in your closet. The answers are going to be with him, which is your neighbor, which is your spouse, which is your co-worker. And that's who he is. That's where he is. The solutions is realizing what we all are. No matter how much this person irritates me, and how much this person constantly talks, man, do you, do you really have to talk that much? I'm just assuming what you all think about me. Do you really have to constantly be talking? Just shut up already. You're not telling me to shut up. You're telling Christ in me to shut up. How dare you? Wish I would stop talking. Right? <laughs> but we think about the people in our lives and, and, and how we're frustrated with them and irritated by them. You don't think we're frustrated and irritated Jesus when he was walking around here? Philip, how? How can you? Philip, you've been with me all this time. How can you still not get it? How can you still stand here before me and say, show us the Father? How do you not understand yet, Philip? How do you not? How many times do we see those situations with Jesus? The Pharisees come before him and ask him a question, right? And he says, he says well, I'll answer your question, but only after you answer my question. Remember that scene? He had to have been frustrated and annoyed. I don't know. But he never gave up. He never changed his mind about them. He never stopped loving them. He never stopped loving us. We just think he did in our minds. We've lost hope because we think we've lost the Son of God. Because we've been looking for him and looking for him and looking for him in all the wrong places. We're looking for him in scriptures. We're looking for him in experiences. We're looking for him in worship songs. We're looking for him in church. Why are you looking for him? Did you not know he must be in his father's house? So stop looking for him. Start living with him. How do you do that? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. You just do. You just do. You come to that day where you realize what we all are. We're all members of the human race. This is the same race that God himself became incarnate. As if the sorrows and the stupidities of this life can overwhelm us now that we realize what we all are. So walking around shining like the sun. That's who we are. It's not just who I am. 
That's who you are. That's who that seventeen-year-old kid that Karen mentioned. Talk about a kid who's going to be hard. You know, I mean, you look at that kid, and I don't. I can just assume because I knew how I was when I was that kid at seventeen. Nobody thought I was walking around shining like the sun. But maybe if somebody had come up to me at that time and said, "You know, you walk around shining like the sun," maybe it would have changed me. Maybe I wouldn't have had to go through some of the things I had to go through. But all people did back then was just condemn me, yell at me, suspend me, tell me I was nothing. Tell me, why you just stop acting that way? It's not that easy. Not many people around that time were coming up to me and just loving me for exactly who I was, for exactly the way that I was. I mean, what would have happened if they had? Now we know the 17-year-old kid, right now all he needs is somebody to come up to him and love him. Love him for exactly who he is. Love him exactly the way that he is. Think about how his life can be transformed. These are my thoughts. And they're just thoughts. But I want to stop wasting all this time looking for something I already have. And I want us to all realize what we all are. Because the world needs it right now. The world needs to know. All these people in this world need to know that they're walking around and shining like the sun. And I think that's our goal. That's our mission. That's our job. Is to go out there and love people. Not condemn them. Not smack them in the face of scripture. Not judge them. But to simply just love them. Roy like Kelsey used to always say, you find out where they are, you love them where they are, and then you minister to them. And for me, you find out where they are, you love them where they are, and that's ministering to them.